Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is about programming. So unless you've programmed before, this whole programming process can seem quite mysterious and very strange and very unnatural. But there's actually a bunch of different activities that we do that are quite similar to programming in many ways. So I'm going to start off by talking about a couple of these. So one activity that's quite analogous to programming is giving directions. If somebody asks me how to get to San Francisco International Airport from Stanford, I would say, get on Sand Hill Road, travel east till you hit the freeway, get on to 280 North, uh, switch to 380 East, switch to 101 South in the SFO lanes, and you should hit the airport. So I've given a series of instructions, uh, and if the person who I've given the instructions to follows the instructions properly, they should end up at SFO. Another example is cooking. So um, here are the instructions for making Kraft macaroni and cheese. Uh, you boil the water, you stir in the macaroni and cook for seven to eight minutes. You drain, you add butter, milk, and cheese mix, and then you mix well. So again, uh, for both these tasks, we are giving, um, by the way, that's Maddie sneezing, if you're wondering what's going on over there. Uh, for both these tasks, we've given a number of directions uh, that should be carried out step by step, and they are to be carried out in the order in which they're listed. That is important. Uh, and they are not to skip any of the steps. That actually turns out to be important as well. Um, so if our instructions are good and the user follows them explicitly, they should successfully fulfill the task. Uh, that we've given instructions for. So the good news here is the computer will always follow the instructions exactly. It turns out that that's not always the case with humans. And just to give a rather embarrassing example, um, one of the first things I remember trying to cook was Kraft macaroni and cheese. And I skipped one of the steps, which was the drain step. And I ended up with Kraft macaroni and cheese soup. It was pretty disgusting. Um, and this would be an amusing tale if I were like five at the time, but I was actually in college. So, all right. Well, that's not going to happen with the computer. If you tell the computer to drain the macaronis, it will drain the macaronis. So uh, another thing to keep in mind here is we've got, so I've got my little program here. Um, so the computer, as I said, will carry out the instructions in the order listed, and it will execute them in the order in which they're listed. And it actually turns out that last part is kind of important. And this is something that um, I have found that many new programmers don't pay a lot of attention to. That is the order in which you list the instructions for the computer is often very important. So if we look at our little program here, um, I ask the computer to uh, ask the user for the temperature in Celsius. I carry out my little Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion, and then I go ahead and print out the uh, temperature in Fahrenheit. It has to happen in this order. If I reverse the order of any one of these statements, we have a problem. So in the bottom example here, I have asked the user what the temperature is in Celsius, and then I print what the temperature is in Fahrenheit, and then I calculate the temperature in Fahrenheit. That doesn't make sense. So in this case, the ordering is very important. If I reorder these, it's not going to work. And I do often see students just randomly reordering their statements because it's not working, and they figure if they just reorder them, maybe that'll fix things. You need to think carefully about what the order is and why the statements are in that order and put them logically in the correct order. So uh, in this particular example, we are converting a total number of minutes to the number of hours and minutes. And in actually, in this particular case, the ordering of those first two statements is not important. If I calculate the number of hours first, followed by the minutes, or if I calculate the minutes first, followed by the hours, that can actually go in either order. Whereas that last statement, the print statement, does have to happen after the first two statements occur. So ordering is often important, but not always important. Again, the best way to work this out is to think things through logically. What is each of these statements doing? Is the order between this statement and the next statement, or this statement and the previous statement, is that important, or is that not important? Okay, as I suggested in the last lecture, there is this edit debug cycle where I write or edit my code, I try it out, see if it works. Um, if it doesn't work, I go back to writing or editing the code and I try it out again and I just keep on repeating that process as long as necessary. 
This is very similar to the process we had for our HTML and CSS. Um, and this is the process we will use for Python or for any other programming language. The one area where I think um, it's not that, that this process falls apart, it is still the same process, but the one area where the process with programming is harder than the process with HTML and CSS is that in HTML and CSS, the results are always visible. That's one of the reasons why I like teaching HTML and CSS first. You, you load that up in the web page and you can see what went wrong. Oh, I thought I was only making, you know, the title bold, but I see the entire web page is bold. I start thinking about what might make the entire web page bold. Maybe I forgot to end my bold tag. Um, so in HTML and CSS, the results are always visible. With programming, sometimes the results are invisible, and in particular, the intermediate results are often invisible because you recall from our previous discussion, we have these storage locations, which are referred to as variables, and we are storing our intermediate results in these variables. We don't know what the variables are set to. And uh, in order to figure out, you know, if, if, if we start up a program and it works, great. But if we start up our program and it doesn't work, the question is, why isn't it working? And a lot of times the reason why it's not working is our intermediate results are wrong. Uh, and so how am I going to figure out what the intermediate results are because they're invisible? Well, um, as a professional programmer, there are a variety of different tools we can apply to make the uh, the invisible results visible. But the easiest thing for someone just starting out is to just use a print statement. So you recall if I use a print statement, it is just going to print the value of whatever's inside that print statement out onto uh, the Python interpreter or the Python shell. And so here, let's say I've got this variable x. I don't know what x is doing. It, it doesn't seem to be working. I'm, I'm guessing that X is wrong, but I'm not really sure because I can't actually see it. It's invisible. What I do is I, I add this print X statement into my code. And again, you can think about where, where to put in your code. It's going to vary depending upon which part of your code you're concerned about. But you know, wherever I put in print X, what's going to happen is the Python shell will print the value of X right there. And I'll, I'll either be like, oh, that, that actually looks like what I'm expecting it to be. So maybe the problem is in another variable um, or it prints out the value of X. I'm like, that's not right. I, I think it should be this other value. And then I start digging into the code, trying to figure out why the value of X is what, what the Python interpreter thinks it is as opposed to what I think it should be. And there's actually a fancier version of this. Um, here's a fancier version, print quote X, end quote, comma, x. Okay, so what this is going to do is that first x, which is in quotes with, with a colon after it, remember that's a string. So remember, the computer is going to distinguish between strings and variable names. If there's quotes around it, and remember, we need to use the standard straight quotes instead of the angle quotes, which um, if they ever show up on my slides, it's because PowerPoint loves turning them into angle quotes. Uh, there is a way to turn it off, but then when you're typing actual English and the angle quotes look nice, then you don't get those. Anyway, uh, so uh, use the regular straight quotes. Um, if you're using Visual Studio Code, if you're using uh, if you're using the Python editor, built-in editor, it should just give you the standard quotes, shouldn't give you the angle quotes. Anyway, so those, those straight quotes, that identifies a character sequence, a string of characters. And so... I'm saying print the following string of characters as is, just literally as I've given it to you. So it will print a X followed by a colon. And then that second X after the comma says, you know, that's not inside of quotes, that's actually a variable name. So it will go ahead and retrieve the value of X. So let's say the value of X is currently three. What this print statement would print is X colon three. And so this is going to be useful if you're printing out the value of a bunch of different variables and it's going to identify, you know, if I've got in another place, I have print quote y colon end quote comma y. Um, I'll see in one place x is 12, y is 15. And so it's useful to, to go ahead and add, add in that um, extra label uh, that's going to get printed out um, when I'm trying to figure out what the different variables are, are being set to. Okay, another thing to be aware of is there's actually several different types of errors that can occur um, when we're programming. There are what are referred to syntax errors and semantic errors. A syntax error occurs when there's an error in the grammar. 
So here um, I'm trying to take Celsius and then you see I've got that multiply divide by five and that doesn't make sense because you can't multiply something and then divide it without telling me what you're multiplying by. This is just, this is gibberish. All right, so this would be the equivalent of trying to take a sentence in a language, uh, a human language, and not following the correct grammar rules. So, uh, you know, with humans, the human can sometimes figure out what it is you're trying to say. But with the computer, if you don't follow the grammar rules, if you don't follow the syntax rules, remember syntax and grammar are basically synonymous uh, when we're talking about computer languages here. Um, if you're not following the grammar or the syntax rules, the computer is just going to be like, Patrick, I have no idea what it is you're trying to tell me, so I'm just going to ignore it. So that's the first source of errors. And generally, you're going to determine if you have syntax errors when you edit your program in the Python editor and you tell it to run, it will immediately tell you, hey, I looked through this program you're telling me to run, and there's a bunch of stuff that are completely illegal in Python. These are not allowed. And those are your syntax errors. The other source of errors is semantic errors. Uh, semantic errors occur when um, you have a perfectly legal program, but it's not actually correct. So in this case, I'm converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. I'm multiplying by nine. I'm dividing by five. Uh, it turns out I'm also supposed to add 32 to it, and I didn't. So this program will run. It is perfectly legal, uh, grammatically correct, syntactically correct Python, but it's going to give me the wrong answer. And so in contrast with the syntax errors, which will be discovered by Python as soon as I tell it to run, it will list, hey, here's a bunch of things you did wrong. These are illegal. Uh, the semantically incorrect program is legal. It will run. It's just not going to give you the correct result. And so when that happens, you know, if it's a short program, you just have to look over the program and try and figure out, you know, wh why did I get this number when I thought I was supposed to get this other number? When you've got a slightly longer program, then you have to go back to what I said a couple of minutes ago about trying to figure out what those invisible intermediate results are and what's going wrong with those. So add in some print statements to figure out what's going wrong. Okay, the last thing I wanted to tell you is that, you know, I, I, programming can be very frustrating. And a lot of times when you're first starting out as a programmer, you think that I have all these errors in my program. This must be my fault. And I must not be very good at this. And that's actually not true. So it turns out that if you have bugs in your code, you have bugs or errors in your code. Uh, we call errors in code bugs. Um, there's actually a story about why they're called bugs. It's not clear entirely this is, this is apocryphal, although apparently this story did happen. It's not clear that this is why they're called bugs. But the story is that back when we had electromechanical machines, um, a program was not working. And when they went to try and figure out why the program was not working, there was a moth stuck in one of the electromagnetic switches, and therefore they said it was a bug. So that part of the story is actually true. And the person who found the bug is Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. If you've got computer science friends, there is a big conference for women in computer science named after her. Um, she created one of the uh, most widely used programming languages back in the day called COBOL. And the Navy actually has a photograph of the bug that she found. What's less clear is that this is actually the source of the name bug. But it's an amusing story, so I thought I'd pass it on to all of you. Anyway, so bugs. You have bugs in your code. You have bugs in your code because you are a human being, and human beings generally do not write code correctly the first time. It's a normal occurrence. It means that you are not some sort of a robot. So that's mostly all to the good. You know, the TAs and I have bugs in our code. So if you have bugs in your code, congratulations, we have bugs in our code. There have been plenty of times where I have sat there with my computer and wanted to take the computer and throw it out the window because I was so sure I had written the code correctly and it was still wrong. And, you know, it's just super frustrating to try and figure out what you did wrong. You're, you're really sure you, you, you screwed up. In fact, one of the very rare occurrences is about five or six years ago, I was had just taken over 108. Um, and every year I would... 
uh, when I first took over CS 108, I would re rewrite the homework assignments on my own before the students did to just sort of remind myself of what the students were, were going to be struggling with. And I remember one of the programs I wrote and it actually ran the first time and it was shocking. It was amazing. It was the best feeling ever. And I mentioned this because like, that's super unusual. That never happens. I still remember that it was like five or six years ago. Having bugs in your program is totally normal. It is not because you are not up to programming. It is because it is part of the programming experience. And in fact, professionals have bugs in their code and they often have many bugs in their code. And that's one of the reasons why programs are constantly updated. So, you know, if you see the operating systems being updated, like Windows is constantly being updated. Um, your apps are constantly being updated. Sometimes it's add in new features, but more often than not, it's because they had a bug in their code that they discovered, or maybe there's a security hole in their code because they didn't think things through carefully. And so uh, having bugs in your code is a perfectly normal part of the experience. I think those of us that become programmers, it's just that the joy of actually creating a running program and seeing something that we thought of in our head, and we've actually created it and it's up and running, that joy of finally getting it all running is worth the frustration of uh, having problems with our code until we get them all debugged. But um, you know, don't don't feel that there's something wrong because you have bugs in your code. It is part of being a human being. Again, it is something that every programmer experiences, including the TAs and myself and uh, all the professional programmers. All right. In the next video, we're going to extend your programming capability by adding in um, some new structures that will actually greatly enhance what you're able to do with your programs. I'll talk to you soon.